Good morning. And uh, welcome back to the Hopkinton Senior Center. My name is Arthur Bergeron. For those of you who haven't been with me for these presentations, um, I'm an elder law attorney. I work at Myrick O'Connell. There are 70 of us, uh, 20 in Westboro, 40 in Worcester, and 10 in Boston around. Um, and so everybody gets to specialize. Uh, and so I do nothing but this. I do nothing but elder law. Um, thank you very much to the folks from the Hudson, or sorry, from the Hopkinton Senior Center for inviting me to do these presentations. I've been coming now for maybe five or six years. Uh, I try to do two presentations in the spring, which are more general presentations about Elder Law 101 and 102, and then more specific ones in the fall. This is one of the specific ones. And it deals with probably the most common issue that I face, especially talking to new clients who will walk in the door or call and say, I really need an irrevocable trust. <clears throat> and I'll say, well, why? And they'll say, well, because everybody's got an irrevocable trust. My neighbor's got one. A friend of mine told me. I heard it on the radio. So I thought I'd spend some time talking about um, what that's based on. Um, because most people, uh, especially couples, don't need an irrevocable trust. <clears throat> and even if you're thinking about doing an irrevocable trust, it may be that there's an easier and cheaper way to deal with the issues you're trying to face. So that's why I tried to design this presentation. Now, if you've been here with me before, you know about my couple, Frank and Mary, uh, and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And their, and their goal in life is very simple. Um, <clears throat> they want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. Unfortunately, at this point, Frank is now dead, and he's buried in the backyard. It is now only a picture, and it's only Mary. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about Mary's planning. Um, Although we're going to talk about also what would have happened if Frank had still been alive. So once again, her goal is very simple. She wants to stay in her house until she dies. She wants to be buried in the backyard. She wants to leave as much as possible to her kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Um, she has no place in her will does she say anything about want, wanting to leave anything to the nursing home or to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Or anything. So one of her goals may be to try to make sure that those folks don't inadvertently become part of her estate plan. Her assets are fairly straightforward. She's got a house worth uh, $400,000. She's got no mortgage. She's got an IRA worth about $200,000 and she's got other assets worth about $200,000 for a total assets of $800,000. She has income, monthly income, just from Social Security, $2,000 a month. So she's not living high, um, but on the other hand, she's got enough to pay her bills, right? She doesn't have a mortgage. She's safe. <clears throat> unless she ends up with significant nursing home costs or costs of home care to stay at home in order to avoid going to the nursing home because nobody, nobody that I've ever spoken to wants to go to a nursing home, is ever planning so that they can go to the nursing home. They're always planning about what happens in the event they have to go, right? So we're going to talk about this situation. So first, the reason why Mary would come to me and talk about this is because she'd be worried that if she goes to a nursing home, <clears throat> excuse me, there may be a significant effect on her assets. This is what Mary thinks would happen if she went to a nursing home. She, the nursing home costs around here, well, they vary from nursing home to nursing home, but about $12,000 a month uh, or $144,000 a year. Remember, Mary's income is $2,000 a month or $24,000 a year. Um, which means that if she were in a nursing home on private pay, she'd be spending about $120,000 per year. That would be her burn rate, the rate at which he would be having to dip into her savings or other assets to pay for a nursing home. And so Mary is saying to herself, oh my God, if I do that, then after five years, I will have burned away $600,000. That's 120,000 times five. <clears throat> and there will only be $200,000 left for my kids. That's what she thinks would happen. So let's start off, though, by, say, by, by having you appreciate what would really happen. What would really happen if Mary went to the nursing home is, first of all, she would, um, if she applied for Mass Health, she'd want to apply for Mass Health as soon as possible. How would she do that? Well, first, her home is not a countable asset in terms of qualifying for Mass Health. Once she's on Mass Health, Mass Health will put a lien on her home to make sure that Mass Health gets reimbursed following her death for whatever Mass Health pays, but it, it, she doesn't have to sell her house in order to get into the nursing home. Second, she can take her money at that point, the day before she wants to qualify for Mass Health, and do some things with it in order to allow her to qualify. To qualify, she has to show that she has less than $2,000 in countable assets, 
and remember she had 400,000, but she could use those, those funds in one of two ways. One, she could put the money into a D4C pooled trust. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of a D4C pooled trust. That's zero. So that, that's about the tip, the average of how many people have heard of these. So a D4C pooled trust uh, is a trust authorized by the federal government um, uh, to deal with these issues. They are trusts managed by nonprofits for the benefit of elderly and disabled people. There are five in Massachusetts. And the rules are that you can transfer these funds to the trust, and then the trust will use this money, if you're Mary, on your behalf to, to benefit you in any way that you can be benefited in terms of supplementing your care or paying for your other bills, like, for example, paying your mortgage, uh, or, your, or not your mortgage, but your taxes and your insurance on your house, right? To do anything that would benefit you. But under federal law, once the funds are in the D4C pool trust, they are no longer countable uh, for, in order for Ma Mary to qualify for MassHealth. Now, MassHealth will have a lien on these funds, and we're going to talk about that later. But the point is, you can transfer the funds, and they will no longer be countable. And the day after, those funds won't count if you're applying for MassHealth. Uh, now, now, by the way, what I'm talking about only applies here in Massachusetts and in some other states. For example, in Connecticut and in several other New England states, a transfer into a D4C pool trust is subject to the five-year look-back period. Uh, in Massachusetts, that's not the case. I'll also mention that there is some uh, state legislation being considered regarding pool trust. Governor Baker had tried to, to eliminate this mechanism for mass health planning, uh, but there's been a tremendous amount of pushback in the legislature because we have so many seniors in, you know, in Massachusetts. And so it appears that the compromise will be that there will be a limit on the amount you can put into the pool trust and that that limit will be $750,000. So for most people, that's going to take care of your problem. <clears throat> so first, you can put the money into a D4C pool trust. Second, Mary could use the money to buy an annuity. As long as that annuity, which is a, an annuity, it needs to be of a specific kind, an immediate, it's called an immediate term annuity where you give money to the insurance company and they start paying you back immediately, like within the first month or two, regular monthly payments. Now, as long as the, that annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Mary's actuarial life expectancy, the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset, remember she too, has too much in countable assets, to a non-countable income stream. So she could d use either of these devices. Now, <clears throat> these devices, there's a lot of ins and outs to these devices, and the next presentation I do here, which I would like to tell you I know the date of, but I don't remember. Um, but it is in a couple of months. Uh, we're going to talk about just those two devices. And we're going to talk about how it is that you can always, always qualify for MassHealth. So the point is that Mary could do those things. And once she had qualified for MassHealth, MassHealth, would that's not, she would still have to pay her income to the nursing home, her Social Security check, $2,000, minus a small adjustment. But we'll just say $2,000. And MassHealth will pay the rest. Now. What is, significant, what is significant is that MassHealth will have a lien on those remaining assets of hers in order to, to collect what MassHealth has paid following Mary's death. So you would say to yourself, well, big deal. She has the ability to qualify for MassHealth, but what did it save her? Well, what it saved her is this. <clears throat> if Mary is on private pay at that nursing home in that double, which almost 100% of the rooms in nursing homes are doubles, She's going to be paying about $12,000 per month, as we just talked about. Um, the, once she has a qualified for mass health, the mass health lien on that very same bed in that very, or excuse me, the mass health rate for that very same bed in that very same nursing home is going to be around $7,000. Once again, prices vary depending on how much, um, how sick Mary is, how much care she needs. Mass health actually measures it in terms of the estimated number of nurse minutes per day that Mary will need while she's in the nursing home. It's a classic bureaucratic term. But once again, it's going to be around 7000 Trust me, it's going to be around $7,000. And, and, and that's unrelated, by the way, to what the private pay rate is. I've often seen cases where the private pay rate for a nursing home is higher than most. Um, but the mass health rate is still around $7,000. So the point is, though, that when mass health then turns around after Mary dies, to collect, to collect on its lien on all of these other assets, 
all that they're going to collect is what they paid. And what they paid is going to be about seven, is going to be $7,000 per month, um, uh, which is $84,000 a year, minus Mary's $24,000 a month, because remember, Mary would still be paying her Social Security checks to the nursing home, right? Which means the amount of the lien only grows at $60,000 a year, or at the end of five years, $300,000 which means that at the end of five years, as long as Mary has been smart about this and qualified for mass health, there will still be $500,000 left for her kids. So the lien will only be $300,000, all right? So <clears throat> that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about Mary trying to save assets by doing something, is how does she save the $300,000? That's the question. Now, in order to save the $300,000, Mary has two choices. She can get married, or she can give the money away and wait five years, or give the assets away and wait five years. Now, I always tell people, you know, the easy way is to get married. Now, nobody has done that yet, right? I've yet to have a single client do it. But if she, if she did, it would be terrific. And the reason is, if she did, if, for example, she and Frank were still alive, or if she had just met the man of her dreams, you know, and, and they're both alive, uh, or, you know, I mean, so gay marriage is okay now, so if you've got a good friend that's living with you, you can just marry him, you know, in order to take care of this. So the point is, if, if, if Mary needed to qualify and she had Frank, and they had those same assets, $400,000 house, a $200,000 IRA, and a $2,000 in cash, um, the way that she would qualify immediately, immediately is, <clears throat> she would transfer everything to Frank. While Mary has an a, uh, asset limit of $2,000 before she can qualify, as we discussed, the spouse, husband or wife, can own, all, can own the house no matter what the equity, no matter what the equity. I do a lot of work in um, Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. There is no house in Nantucket that I can find that's worth less than a million dollars. I mean, it's, they're really, got to be really small. I did see one. I saw one. It was a classic fixer-upper. It was less than 1,000 square feet. I was in Nantucket over the weekend at their senior fair. And it was on sale for like $999. It was like $990,000 for this. It was, just, it was amazing. So the point is, we do this all the time. It, it, you can just transfer your house to your spouse, a $3 million house. Doesn't make any difference. And then you qualify for mass health. Um, um, Fra so Frank would have the house. Um, Mary can have, or, or excuse me, while Mary can't have more than $2,000, Frank can have as much as more than that figure. That figure was valid until the spring and I forgot to change it. So that figure is actually 100, I believe it's $125,400. But it's around there, right? Now, so now we, but he still have too much money, right? Because Mary would have just transferred all of her 400,000 to him, the, the IRA and, the, uh, and the, um, the other cash. So what does he do? Well, what, Mar what Frank does then, is he goes and buys the same annuity that I was just describing earlier. He, he would buy an annuity, and as long as the annuity called for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy, the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream if it's Mary. As far as Frank is concerned, it's the same thing. What he does is he turns this asset into an income stream, and as the, the healthy spouse Frank is allowed to have unlimited income. So he can convert any amount of money. We've done annuities for a million dollars. He can convert all the money into this income stream. And the next day, because he meets these asset criteria, Mary can qualify for mass health. Now, the only other thing that I would advise Frank to do with that in that case, though, because Frank would be concerned, like all spouses are concerned, what if I die, especially if I know my wife's got some you know, memory issues or whatever. But even if she doesn't, what if I die? How do I protect my wife? And so the way you do that is Frank would simply do a new will that says that following his death, the assets that would have gone to Mary will instead go in trust for her benefit, uh, in trust for her benefit. He can name anybody he wants, but typically he'd name one of his kids or more than one of his kids as the trustee. As long as he had done that, if he then dies, all of these assets that are now in his name are going to be safe, even if Mary's already in a nursing home or if, even if she's not. They're going to be non-countable and non-leanable. So remember, Mary's easiest alternative is to get remarried, right? But what if she doesn't want to do that? Well, in that case, she has to give money away. If she wants the money to be protected, 
she needs to give it away because the, con the Mass Health is designed, Mass Health, which is the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program, is health insurance for the poor, as opposed to Medicare, which we all have. I, I look, I'm looking around at this audience, which pretty much all of us have, which is health insurance for the old, right? So you got to show that you're poor, right? So, so Mary, if she wants to show that she's poor, um, has to show that she has less than $2,000 in countable assets, but also that she didn't give anything away to anybody but the spouse. You can always give away things to your spouse. There is no look back period regarding that. That's why the previous thing worked. If you're giving it to anybody but the spouse though, even your lawyer, I tell people you can always give it to your lawyer, um, th then there is this five year look back period that you can't give it away if, if you've, if, when MassHealth, when you're applying, MassHealth requires that you submit to them your financial records for the previous five years so that they can see whether you try to self-impoverish, right, to just get rid of assets. And if you did, then MassHealth is going to declare you to be ineligible if you did during that five-year period. So you got to give it away. <clears throat> She's got two possibilities in this case. She could give it away to her kids or to an irrevocable trust. She could give it to anybody else. Once again, I tell people you can always give it to your lawyer. No one has taken me up on that. But suppose she's going to give it to her kids. So she's thinking about giving it to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. So, and she can do that. And there's nothing bad that happens as a result of making those gifts. As we've discussed before here, there is no gift tax. There is this myth that there's some kind of limit on the amount you can give somebody in one year. And if I were to ask you that limit, you could mostly tell me. You'd say $15,000. And I'd say to you, well, what bad thing happens if you give somebody more than $15,000 in a year? And you couldn't tell me. Because the answer is nothing bad happens unless you have a total estate of more than $11 million. So if that's an issue, I'm glad to talk to you about it after the presentation. But unless that's your worry, you can give away as much as you want to anybody in any year. Okay. Oh, people are looking at me going, no, that can't. It's true. That is true. Um, now, there may be other concerns that Mary has about giving it away. And, and she may decide, by the way, that she doesn't want to give everything away. Because, you know, even if you really trust your kids, do you really want to have to call them all the time if you're going to go on a trip, you know, or if you, your house is, needs repairs? No, right? So she's probably going to keep some. And I tell people in this situation, keep as much as you want. You know, the, the goal of life when you get to our age is to sleep well at night. Fame and fortune have passed you by at this point, right? You're not thinking about that anymore. You just want to get a good night's sleep. So if it bothers you that you can't just go to the bank and write yourself a check for $20,000 or $30,000 or $50,000 or $100,000, then keep it, right? But if there's anything you want to save, against the possibility you may need nursing home care, that you have to give away. So in this case, what Mary want, may want to do is keep her um, IRA money, because in order to give it away, she'd have to first cash it in, pay the taxes, and then give the remaining amount away. So she may want to give away the other money, figuring that she's, if she needs the money, she's going to live on that IRA money. Now, admittedly, when she takes it out, she's going to have to pay a tax on it, but I can almost guarantee you that her tax rate, given the fact that her other income is only $2,000 a month, is going to be lower than that of any of her kids. So she's actually better using that money and giving away the other money in terms of her kids. Because when her kids go to, if, if the, she saves the IRA and then the kids get it and they go to get the money, they're going to pay income tax on it but they're going to pay at their tax rate, which is much higher than Mary's is, or it often much, much higher. So anyway, there's that consideration. Regarding the house, she may not want to just give away all of her interest in the house. And the reason for that is um, the capital gains tax rules. If, if, if in, and many of you, once again, kind of know these, that if you, if you bought something, a house for a little bit and you sell it for a lot, the difference is a capital gain, which is income, and you have to pay a tax on that, the capital gains tax. Now, if you've been living in the house for two of the previous five years, the house that you own, you get an exemption by virtue of the fact that you've been living there. But if Mary gives her house to her kids, unless they're living there, when the kids turn around and sell the house, they're going to pay a capital gains tax because they don't live there, right? And their tax basis in the property, the, 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 the amount based upon which gonna, that capital gain is going to be computed, is what Mary bought the house for. 
right? So that could be a big difference, right? What she bought the house for and what the kids sell the house for. On the other hand, if Mary holds the house until she dies, at the moment of her death, that basis in the house, the tax basis in the house, jumps from the purchase price to the date of death value. So if Mary held the house until she died, and then the kids sold it, they wouldn't pay any capital gains tax because the difference between the basis and the sale price would be zero. Now, there is another way that Mary can do that while at the same time protecting the house, and that is she could transfer to the kids a so-called remainder interest in the house and keep a life estate. What does that mean? Uh, it means that she is keeping total control of the house, the right to rent it, right, the obligation to pay the taxes and the insurance, the obligation to, if, she, she, if somebody falls down on the property, she's still responsible, right, all those things. She still takes the tax deduction regarding the house. All of that stuff she keeps until the moment of her death. It's a life estate. She has total ownership until the moment of her death. But what she's going to transfer to the kids is something called the remainder interest. And the kids are actually going to be called the remainder men, which is the interest in the property for the remainder of time, literally for the remainder of time. Because when you own a property, as Mary does right now in fee, F-E-E, -E, it's an old legal, English legal term, you own it until the end of time. Is it, unless you don't live that long. But what also, that also means is that if you own it and you die, that your, your family gets it, right? And if they, don't, they own it until they die, then their family gets it until the end of time. So you can, through a deed, or Mary could through a deed right now, separate those interests, keep a life estate, and transfer right now to the kids this remainder interest in the property. If she does that, then for IRS purposes, when she dies, there will still be a step up in the, in the tax basis of the property. So the kids will still be able to sell the property tax-free. So there are some issues that she's going to want to talk about with the kids. But the point is she can do it. Now, she may have some con specific concerns. A, will they give it back? Because, of course, she's not really wanting to give them the property now, right? She's wanting them to hold it in case she needs it. But she can't keep control of it because otherwise she'd be violating the mass health rules because you can't have it. You can't have control of it. And so what if they won't give it back? So that's always a concern, right? So you want to make sure uh, if you're giving the property to your kids that you give it to the one you trust to give it back if you need it, right? Um, the second thing is what if even if you gave it to the trusted kid, the child ends up having a problem? <clears throat> what if they have a creditor problem? Somebody sues them, right? And well, of course, if they own your money or your house, well, then somebody can attach that house, right? What if there's a divorce, right? I've had that, I had that situation occur a few years ago uh, with a property on Martha's Vineyard where a lady called me and she had transferred a remainder interest to her one son, kept a life estate, more than five years had gone by, so the house was now safe for mass health purposes, but she just called me because she wanted to check because her husband just got served with divorce papers by the wife. She said, do I have a problem? I said, oh yeah, you've got a problem. Your son owns the remainder interest in the house and you're 80 years old and using the IRS's table regarding how you allocate value between the remainder interest and the life estate, your son owns 80% of your $800,000 house or $640,000 worth of value and that's now in play in that divorce, right? So oh, that's not good. So if there's a, that's a concern, right, you've got to be careful. Finally, you want to make sure that you don't inadvertently disqualify one of your kids for a government benefit. What if your child has a disability? What if your child is on Section 8? What if your child needs to qualify for mass health? Well, you don't want to inadvertently give your child assets that will cause him to be disqualified because they'll be, have too much in assets, right? So you need to kind of think those things out. Um, but... If, so if you're, and if you can't figure it out, right, then your alternative is to give your property to uh, the trustees of an irrevocable trust. Now, what is an irrevocable trust? What is a trust? A trust is a relationship. It's not a separate legal person. It's a relationship between two kinds of people, the trustee and the beneficiaries. The trustee is the legal owner of trust property, but not for himself or herself, but for the benefit of the beneficiaries, right? So if I give you something right now, if I, what, is the, what, is kind of, what is the significance of that? Let me kind of go through that. Remember, if I've given at your, my assets away, or if Mary has to her kids, 
then mass health won't count them. Why is that? Well, if I give you something, if I give you $100 today, if I give you $100, and then tomorrow I go, no, I need that money back, and I call you, do you have to give it back to me? No, no, because I gave it to you. What is a gift? In order to make a legal gift, you have to have donative intent, that is, the intent to make a gift, as opposed to a loan. You have to have delivery. You have to deliver the gift to the person you're giving it to. Um, and you have to have acceptance. They have to accept it. Once that has happened, you can't take it back. Okay? Now, given that legal fact, what if, you've, if you want to take care of your kids or somebody, you want to give them something, but you're kind of concerned about whether they're going to handle it responsibly, right? Well, in that case, what people will often do is instead, they'll create a trust. And they'll name some third party, that person's father or mother or your brother or somebody, right? As the trustee, the le person in legal control of the property, or themselves. They might create a trust and name themselves as the trustee for the benefit of somebody. But they'll keep the option, in case they need the asset, to take it back. Because they'll typically structure things this way. Often people structure things this way in order to avoid the probate process. They'll put their assets, like their house, into a revocable and amendable trust. They'll say, I'm the trustee for the benefit of my kids and me, but it's revocable and amendable. So anytime I can take it back. But if I die and I'm still owning the property as trustee, my new trustee is going to step in, take my place, and take care of the property so nothing's going to go through the probate process. So there's a, there's a good reason sometimes for using revocable and amendable trust. But the point is, if they're revocable and you can take the asset back, then as far as mass health is concerned, you still own the asset. Right? What is an irrevocable trust? A trust where you can't take it back. Right? No matter who the trustee is, the point of the trust is, you put the asset into the irrevo irrevocable trust, you can't take it back. That's an irrevocable trust. So many people think that if they create an irrevocable trust, just by virtue of the fact that it's irre irrevocable or irrevocable, by the way, you either, the dictionary says you can pronounce it either way, in case you're wondering. So even if it's irrevocable, if you'd put the property into the irrevocable trust, now it's safe. The five-year clock is ticking. That is not the case. The trust not only has to be irrevocable, but there can't be, but you cannot have retained any ability as a result of this trust to get the money back. And the trustee can't even have the discretion as a result of this, of, of the, of the, the, the in, within the trust rules to get the money back. So first it has to be irrevocable, but it also has to be more than that. If you're trying to figure out whether a trust is going to meet the mass health criterion, remember those words. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Those words were actually uh, in the, uh, the decision by the court in the Supreme Judicial Court in Massachusetts that did the first review of an irrevocable trust about mm, 20, over 20 years ago now. And they said, when you're evaluating that trust, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't put stuff into the irrevocable trust so that mass health isn't going to count it, while at the same time still having some control over it, right? And they went actually one step further, this, the court did, and said, if you convey your property to a trustee of a trust, and there is any way that that trustee can give you back the money, whether, whether according to the trust rules or because the trustee has the right to change the rules but through an amendment, if there's any way he can give you the money, it's still yours, okay? So you can't have your cake and eat it too. Now, the official version of those words is actually contained in the federal Medicaid statute. It says that the assets are still yours if there are any circumstances under which payment from the trust could be made to or for the benefit of the individual, that is, Mary or you if you're the senior and you're trying to protect the asset. There's any way to do it. <clears throat> so the real question then is not whether the trust is irrevocable, but whether it meets that standard. So let me start off by telling you one that does meet that standard, and I know that this trust meets the standard because this case went to the Supreme Judicial Court in Massachusetts last year. One of my colleagues at Myrick O'Connell went to the Supreme Judicial Court and defended it, and we won. Medicaid had said that this trust was not valid and that therefore the assets in it were countable. So 
but the, but the court disagreed. The court said this works. So I can tell, guarantee you it works if Peter, Paul, and or Mary are the trustees. The kids are the trustees. Uh, Peter, and I should, <clears throat> I should have been cleaner here and said Mary Jr. Whenever I say Peter, Paul, and the three of them together, I'm always meeting Mary Jr. Um, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. are the sole beneficiaries, right? So the mother is not a beneficiary of the trust. <laughs> distributions, the trustees can at any time make distributions to themselves or to any one of themselves. Without Mary's consent, they can do it at any time. Um, when Mary dies, the trust is going to get liquidated. Uh, that means turned into cash, and the proceeds are going to get divided up. Mary has kept, Mary kept a life estate in the house. So she created this irrevocable trust, transferred the remainder interest to the trustees of the, of the irrevocable trust, and kept the life estate. That trust worked, and the assets that were in them were not countable, and Mary qualified for mass help. So, when you're thinking about what your, how your trust is going to work, here are some things you want to think about. First of all, how do you make sure that you protect Peter, Paul, and Mary? Now, now why do I have to protect them? Well, remember, from creditors, from spouses, you know, that daughter-in-law you never liked, that you don't want to have grab all the money, right? Uh, and from um, uh, claims by the government, from, from disqualification if they have a disability. Because if I am a creditor of Peter's, <clears throat> and this trust has been created, and Peter is the sole trustee, and Peter has the right or the discretion to distribute any assets at any time to any one of the beneficiaries, Peter, himself, Peter, Paul, or Mary Jr. And I'm a creditor of Peter, and I get a judgment against Peter for $100,000. That judge, I can ask the judge to order Peter in that case to exercise his discretion, to use the discretion he has to distribute money to himself, right? I, the judge will do that for me because, that, because Peter owes me money, right? And if I'm, uh, if I'm, the, if I'm Peter's uh, estranged wife, similarly, <clears throat> I can have the total amount that Peter could distribute to himself considered to be part of the assets when the divorce money is being divided up, right? So how do you avoid that? Well, one way is to actually just put a maximum amount to the, any distribution that can be made to any one beneficiary in any one year. So at least you're, max, you're maximizing the loss that you could have to take in any one year. A second way, though, most common, is you simply name multiple trustees. Suppose Peter and Paul had both been the trustees of this trust. And suppose the trust said that distributions can be made to any child, but they had to ag be agreed to by both Peter and Paul as the trustees. Well, in that case, if I'm the creditor of Peter, I can get the judge to order Peter to do something, but I can't get the judge to order Paul to do anything. Paul didn't do anything. I've got no claim against Paul. <clears throat> and therefore, I don't get to get a distribution of those assets. So you can protect the assets by paying attention. Okay? Um, <clears throat> how do you protect Mary? How do you protect Mary? Well, first, against the basic question, what if the trustee won't make one of these distributions. Because remember, the way that this would work, if Mary needed the money back, is the trustee would make a distribution to himself or herself or to one of the other beneficiaries, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And then they presumably would turn around and give the money to their mother if their mother needed it, right? If the mother said, you know, I'm broke, or, or would pay the mother's home care costs or the mother's you know, assisted living bill or the ta whatever, right? And by the way, you know, once again, when you think about that, the fact that the trustee at any time can make a distribution to the kids and they can turn around and give it back to the mother at all times, that does sound like it's a scam, doesn't it? You know, and that's the reason why Medicaid had denied the validity of that trust I described and why it went all the way to the Supreme Judicial Court. But the court said, well, wait a minute. Mary could have just given the money to the kids. And if she'd just given the money to the kids and asked, the, asked them for it back, they could have given it back to her, right? But the point is, she didn't have the legal right to force them to give it back to her. And that was why they said this trust was okay. So, so what if you're concerned about this? And well, one way to deal with that is to, make, is, is to specify that there can be distributions to any child and that any one of the children can order a distribution, can order the trustee to make a distribution to himself or herself. Right? So that Mary can be assured that if one of the kids just has a change of heart and says, you know, 
If I can just keep this money till Ma dies, you know, <laughs> and, and that's, a, that's a terrible thing to say. And, 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 and many kids will never think that way, but not all kids. Some kids do think that way. And a number of kids, when they're in this kind of situation, or even if you're not dead yet, they, they kind of think about what they're going to get in, inherit when you die, and they start spending it in their head, you know. Then they get mad if you go to a nursing home and you got to spend some money. Oh my God, it's my inheritance, right? So I'm just saying, this, this, sometimes it just happens. So, so one, one way is, is to make sure that distributions come to any child. Uh, another way is to keep, leave Mary the power to remove the trustee, right? So that if Mary is having trouble with one of the kids, she can just say, oh, sorry, I'm going to remove you. I'm going to name another one. Now, as long as Mary doesn't have the power to name herself as the trustee, this is okay. There are case, there's case law on this. That's okay. Okay, so there's some things she wants to con be concerned about. And what about keeping the use of the house? <clears throat> the safe way to protect the house is to transfer this remainder interest to the kids so that the kids during Mary's lifetime really don't have any interest in the house because it doesn't kick in until after Mary dies. There are trusts where instead of doing that, that Mary has transferred the house to the trustee but kept the right to live there for free, right? No, no rent no taxes, no insurance. Those kinds of cases, you may be having trouble with, with the courts and with Medicaid on. So I, I, we recommend that you, kind of, you stay away from those. What else do you need to want to kind of watch out for? Well, it was very popular I, uh, 10 years ago to structure these as trusts where you're transferring the assets to the kids, but then especially if you're giving them money assets, you're keeping the right to all the income from the assets. That is an unwise strategy. Um, and, and has been challenged in cases because Medicaid will say, well, what's, what's, what's principal and what's income, right? Why can't you as the trustee take some of the principal that you have, <clears throat> even though the trust says you can only distribute income, and turn it into income? If you're the trustee, why can't you take some of the money and buy an annuity for your mother, right? Buy an annuity. That, we know that that's income. We already talked about that. That's a way that you convert principal to income, an income stream. So there are a whole set of issues that you'd rather not have to deal with and you don't have to deal with as long as you don't put the provision in that says that Mary is entitled to the income. Watch out for the income. No loans. No loans. This was another way that many people would try to have their cake and eat it too. They'd put all their assets into a trust. <clears throat> they would, they'd say, oh, I'm not, I'm not a beneficiary. Only my kids are the beneficiaries. But the trustee has the right to lend anybody, including me, money or anything else, right? So as a practical matter, I can get all the money back because of course, I'm not gonna have to repay the loan to the trustee. I mean, the trustee may make me sign something, but the trustee isn't gonna sue me, it's my son, right? And eventually I'm gonna be dead, no one's gonna collect this loan, right? So for, the, for that very reason, courts have said, nah, can't have your cake and eat it too. That's really what's going on here. Finally, um, or not finally, it, once again, Folks have been concerned about putting money into trust, but oh, you know, what if the kids just turn around and spend it all, right? And so they put a provision in that says that, the, that I, Mary, have control over that, that no distribution can be made to any of the kids unless I say it's okay. Nope. It, 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 as a practical matter, you've still got control of that money. Um, Mary as a co-trustee. Oh, the trust says, I'm only the trustee for the benefit of the beneficiaries, the kids, right? But of course, I'm the trustee, which means I can kind of do what I want in terms of managing the assets, making loans, doing all of this other stuff. Nope, you don't want to go there. Stay away from being a trustee. Finally, this is an obscure one, which actually came up last year in that Supreme Judicial Court case. Oftentimes, for various tax planning purposes that I won't go into, um, uh, lawyers would specify that when you're creating one of these trusts, you would retain the power during your lifetime to make distributions or to order distributions to a nonprofit organization of your choice. So it's not like you're distributing it to your kids or anything. It has to be a nonprofit organization. Well, um, it, in, in the course of this case going up that got decided last year, um, Mass Health, when they finally got to the, to the court during argument, raised to the court the fact that 25% of all the nursing homes in Massachusetts are owned by nonprofits, right? So it could be argued that if you go, that you, you, if you're Mary, there is some way 
that you could cover, or if you're the trustee, that you could cover this nursing home care for your mother by simply making sure your mother goes to a nursing home that's owned by a nonprofit, right? So, and, and the court said, that's an interesting point, which we're not going to decide on today, the court said, because it hadn't originally been raised on, on the, during the, in the beginning of the appeal. Um, but Med Medicaid <laughs> certainly was listening. And so about a month ago, there was a case where there was a woman who's, who's had a tr who had put their, her house in a trust that had that provision. She went to a nursing home, applied for Mass Health. The nursing home is not a nonprofit owned nursing home. And Medicaid set, re rejected her application and said the house still counts because she could have gone to a nursing home that was a, owned by a nonprofit. So if this is in your trust, you try to stay away from it. That's all or get it corrected. <clears throat> and you, Mary doesn't want to have a trust that she can amend um, or that the trustee can amend or anybody else for the benefit of Mary. So those are the things you want to watch out for. Now, what if you've already got a trust and it has one of those problems? What do you do? It's an irrevocable trust, right? That means it's non-amendable. Well, actually, that's not true, right? Uh, a, an irrevocable trust can be amendable and still qualify as far as mass health is concerned as long as the trust makes it clear that it's not amendable in a way that could help Mary. That said, suppose you've got one that's not amendable. Well, you can actually amend a non-amendable trust. Who knew? Who knew, right? Um, through the magic of the legal profession, um, you can actually do that. So until um, recently, uh, when something called the, non, uh, the, the Uniform Probate Act was adopted in Massachusetts, you could always amend a non-amendable trust by going to the judge, the probate judge, and asking the judge to amend it. And as long as the parties all agreed, typically the judge would amend the trust for you. So, so as part of the Uniform Probate Act, which was adopted, uh, one of the sections of the Uniform Probate Act says that if all interested parties agree, um, that, that those interested parties on their own, without going to court, can modify a trust in any way that it could have been modified by a court, which is pretty much any way at all. So there actually is a device through which, if you have an existing defective, irrevocable trust, you know, the clock has already run five years, you'd rather, you know, leave the trust in place, but you want to try to correct this problem that you can do it without having to go to court. Now, the question then is, so why would you, <clears throat> why would you do that? Uh, well, because you say to yourself, well, if, if your trust is really defective, when you do that amendment, that amendment is only going to be effective in terms of protecting the assets five years after you do the amendment because your trust was defective. So suppose you do this amendment. And, well, first of all, if you do the amendment now, you change the trust in some way, and then five years go by, well, now you know your trust is safe. But suppose you do the amendment and three years go by, and now you're going into a nursing home, and, and what are you going to do? Well, if that's the case, you still have the old trust. You still have what you had, which you thought was defective. That's why you try to make the change, right? You weren't sure, but you're not sure if it's defective. It may be that it's fine. So you've still got the old trust you haven't lost that, any, any of the rights you had under the old trust by virtue of making the change. So that you can know that at the end of five years after you did the change, you're definitely safe. And in the meantime, you're no worse off than you are right now. So if having a trust that's got a defect bothers you, I'm just saying this is, this is an interesting way to take care of it. And then in general, the moral of the story is you have to get your trust checked, I, we say every five years. And the reason is just that the law changes. Many of the, of the problems that I just referred to were not problems 10 years ago. So there may, you may have a trust that was drafted with the old law in mind before these later court decisions effectively changed the law. But the, prop, but the point is that the, the rules that apply to your trust will be the rules when you apply for mass health, not the rules that applied when you created the trust. Nothing's grandfathered. So that to the extent that you want to kind of stay on top of this, you should get it checked. Finally, as I always tell people at the end of these presentations, the goal of life is to sleep well at night. If you're not especially worried about this stuff, you don't have to do a thing, right? Um, it's only if, but if you are worried, then you should talk to somebody about it so you can sleep better. That's the reason why you do it, right? Thank you very much. Any questions? Any qu I know I covered a ton of stuff. Uh, no.
Oh, okay. Oh, wait a minute. Ah, see, whenever I say no, then, then people raise their hands. That's why I have to say it quick. Uh, you, ma'am, and then you, ma'am, and then you, sir. Yes, ma'am. When you were talking about, um, let's say, the, the selling the house, is the rule still in effect? If this is the only house you lived, my, well, my mother's lived in her house, and the only house she's ever lived in. Yep. You don't get a one-time exemption? For, um, if you if you own your house and you sell it, right? If you if you the rule is if you have lived in the house and owned it for two of the previous five years, when you sell it, um, you get a capital gains exemption equal to two hundred fifty thousand dollars if you're single or five hundred thousand if you're married, and that's not a one-time exemption. It used to be at like twenty five years ago, but you can do that as many times as you want. You can just keep. Buying a new house every two years and turning around and flipping it. I've had people that own three houses. I had people. They had a house in Framingham. They had a, a, a vacation house in the, on the Cape. And then they owned a house in Ohio that they wanted to move to. So they just sold them in order. They sold Framingham first and got the exemption. Then they moved to the Cape for two years and got the exemption. And ended up going to, to Ohio with all their money. Because they didn't pay any capital gains tax on anything. So My mom and dad built the house. And say, for instance, it was twelve thousand dollars when they built it, and now, according to Hopkins, it's around three, three fifty or something right. like that. Right, right. But your father has died, My father has and your and so it's just your mother. Yeah. So when your father's died, so I'm sorry, this is going to be a little, just a little brief interlude on taxes. So when your parents bought the, this is capital gains 101. When your parents bought the house for how much? For $12,000, they each got a basis in that property because they both own the house of $6,000, half of the 12. The moment your father died, right, his basis, because he left the house to your mother or they owned it jointly, right? So his basis in his half of the house jumped to half of the date of death value. So say when he died, the house was worth $200,000. His half is $100,000. So his basis just jumped to $100,000. And your mother still had her old basis of six. So now your mother's basis in that case would be $106,000. If she sells the house for $306,000, right, she's got a capital gain of $200,000, right, the difference between 106 and 306. But she also has her exemption of $250,000. And her exemption is bigger than the gain, which means she'd pay no tax. That explain the plan? Okay, thank you. There's a question. Yes, ma'am, and then you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Two separate questions, please. First of all, your example had children in the picture. What yeah. if there are no children? What would this, the female spouse do then? What if there are no children? Yes. A second question, please. Yeah. The examples also assumed that the wife, Mary, was able to make decisions later in life, such as removing trustees, etc. What if she is not able and no relatives are in place? So regarding number one, the, 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 you, can leave, you can give the money to anybody you want. You just won't need to give it to somebody you trust. You know, if there's, is there a brother? Is there a sister? Is there a niece? Or is there, an, is there someone? If there's no one you can trust, you're stuck, right? Um, the second question, what if there is a trust that is in place, but there is a, a um, um, and there's a trustee that you want to remove, or, for, or there's something that has to be done, and Mary is no longer competent to do it. Your, through, Mary's, through, through Mary's irrevocable power of attorney, or durable power of attorney, which presumably she did, she can name somebody else to make all those decisions for her so that those decisions can still be made. Those, that's why I always tell people the two most important documents you can do of all these documents are your health care proxy and your power of attorney so that if you're incapacitated, somebody can make all these kinds of legal decisions for you through the power of attorney and make your medical decisions through the health care proxy. Okay? Yes, sir. Um, just a question on uh, earlier your strategy of uh, for Mary to uh, get married again yep. to transfer her assets to the new husband if she needed to. Yeah, but that's assuming the husband, the new husband, does not have any assets of his own. Uh, wouldn't you also put a burden if he does? Wouldn't you also put a burden on the new husband? So and that, and that's a very good point. Um, but you can plan around that. So you could you could you well. You'd need to talk, depending on what the, the, that person's assets were, right? You could try to structure things, so, and because this happens in case, second marriage cases, right? 
where the where the often the, the the spouses will say, when I die, I want my assets to go to my kids. And my spouse is going to want his, have his assets to go to his kids or to her kids. So well, you could you could structure this so as to have have the spouses will say that. Right. So that if all the assets were transferred to the spouse upon the, that's upon the the healthy spouse's death, just the assets that were owned by the six spouse will go in trust for her benefit. And, but then in the meantime, you would need to look at the assets to see what it would take for the for the for the the unhealthy spouse to qualify. So, for example, if Mary transferred everything to 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 the new Frank and they both had a house, right? Well, that might be a problem because only there would only be one house that would be exempt. If it if 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 the issue was not the house because there was just one house, but this 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 marriage ended up generating so much cash, right, that that Frank had to buy an annuity, right? It may be that you need to specify in that annuity that during that that you need to you need to do a little formula that structures all that and that says regarding that piece of the annuity that comes from Mary's money, that's going to go ultimately to Mary's family, right? And is going to be provided for through Frank's will when he gets the money back, right? As to the rest of the money, it's going to go to the other side. It is complicated. It makes it complicated. You're absolutely right. But there is a way to structure it. But not the poor. Oh, you can marry a poor person, you know. <laughs> Give do somebody a favor, right? Oh, what about the uh, <laughs> you mentioned about the uh, no estate tax for 11 million. There, no, I, I was talking about gift tax. That there is no gift tax. There is no gift tax. There is no Massachusetts gift tax, and the federal gift tax is only relevant if you have an estate of more than 11 million dollars. I thought, the, I thought there was a gift tax for Massachusetts, but at a lower limit. No. There is no Massachusetts gift tax. Okay? And, and the receipt of a gift is not income. So when you give these assets to your kids, they're not paying any income tax as a result of getting them. Right? For any amount. For any amount. In any amount. Uh, uh, I thought I saw a question here, and then I'm going to go there. Yes, yes, ma'am. If you uh, get uh, covered by Mass Health. Mm -hmm you automatically give up your other private health coverage? If you get mass health, do you give up your other coverage? No. No, mass health is is a, is a like a payer of last resort. It only pays if your other coverage isn't there. So if you are in a nursing home being covered by mass health and you go to the hospital, Medicare is paying your hospital bill. Okay? And then you go back to the nursing home where Medicare doesn't pay for nursing home care. Actually, if that happens, if you went to the hospital under Medicare regs, if you went to the hospital, got better, went to a nursing home, Medicare will pay as much as 100 days worth of nursing home costs. So Medicare would pay the next 100 days you were in the nursing home, then you'd flip back to MassHealth. See how that works? Okay. Uh, I thought there was a question here. Oh, you, yes, I'm sorry, you ma'am and then you ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I want to know that you have a irrevocable trust, mm -hmm. and if you have other assets, mm -hmm. you do not want to put in the trust, mm -hmm. but you put, you can put it in the 4C pool or something, what you have shown before. So, if you had created an irrevocable trust and put some money into it, I, let me see if I've got the question right. If you've created the irrevocable trust and put some money into it, and five years have gone by so that those funds are safe. But you kept some, as I had suggested, that you may very well want to keep some, right? And then you needed to qualify for Mass Health. At that point, you could take that other amount that you had kept, and rather than spending it down on the nursing home, you could put it into the D4C pooled trust and immediately qualify for Mass Health. The answer is yes, that's right. You could do it. That is the one. You can take out some every month or something like that. If you, if you need to. The question is, the, is the question is regarding the money in the pooled trust, can you take it out? Yeah. The, the answer is, the pooled trust can, can pay anything on your behalf. It can't give you money. It can buy things for you or it can reimburse things for you. So typically you, put, you transfer the money to the pooled trust. So say you're married and you kept your money and you, and you transferred all the money to the pooled trust and now you're on the nursing home. And, 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 they, and the pool trust is now going to deal with, not you because you've got dementia that you're in the nursing home, but with the person that you've named through your power of attorney. And your power of attorney says, well, Mary still owns the house. We've got to pay the taxes. No problem. Send us the bill and D4C will pay the taxes. Or they'll, they'll let the 
the, the child pay the taxes and just get reimbursed by the D4C. Suppose Mary needs, this is to me the best example, in the nursing home, a better wheelchair. The most depressing part about going to a nursing home, how many people here have been to a nursing home? Right, so you go in, and maybe, you, maybe this wasn't the case for you, but many nursing homes, you'll go in, and you'll look down one of these corridors, and there'll be people in the corridor in their wheelchairs sleeping like this. They're all crunched up right now. The reason why that's the case is because of the wheelchair, because they're in a wheelchair that wasn't meant to be slept in. It was meant to push people around, right? And that's, a cheap, that's an inexpensive wheelchair, and it was owned by the nursing home. For a little more money, you can buy a wheelchair. The, it reclines. It's motorized. It's got a little coffee, a sippy cup holder. It's got a little TV set with earplugs. So, I mean, nobody wants to be in the nursing home. But if you're there, you're stuck with it. The question is, how can you make your life better in the nursing home? Or how can your kids make life better for you in the nursing home? And they can do that through the money in the D4C pool trust. Okay. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, if you live in Massachusetts, but your children live in other states, or would they be subject to a gift tax within their own state? If you lived in Massachusetts and your kids lived in other states, would they be subject to a gift tax in their state? You'd have to ask, they'd have to ask their lawyer that. Because the question is, is whether in that case, the gift would be, for tax purposes, a gift made in that state versus a gift made in Massachusetts. It would seem to me it would be made in Massachusetts, but I'm not the attorney in that state. So it's their, that's that state's question. But there are very few states that have gift taxes. Um, uh, Ma'am, I'm going to get back to you. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, su uh, supposing you will uh, your assets to your grandchildren and the minors. Mm -hmm. They're not 21 yet. So what do you, what do, you do with them? Give it in the hands of So what if you've willed your assets to grandchildren, but they're minors? So if you, if you have just willed it to them and they are still under age 18, right, then their guardian is going to be able to handle the money for them, right? Their guardian is to typically be their parents, right? And then the guardian would need to distribute the money to them at age 18. If you want to take care of it a different way, then typically what you would do is you would say that that money is going to get held in trust by somebody, probably one of your kids, for the benefit of those grandchildren until they reach a particular age, usually over 18. Okay. And, the, and then the trustee can do whatever he wants. The, then, then the trustee can do whatever he wants. Well, no, it depends on what the trust says. You can limit the trustee in terms of how they're going to invest the money, what they're going to do with it or whatever, until the distributions get made. And you can be very specific regarding when the distributions get made and for what purpose. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Uh, any other questions? No. Yes, ma'am. What are good options for a parent to select as trustee? Who's a good option to, for a parent to? Professional type of party, a lawyer, a bank. Trust. Tr I don't. I don't. I don't especially like trustee, professional trustees, including lawyers, just because they're so expensive. You know, the ideal trustee is a person you trust. You don't necessarily trust the guy at the bank or even your lawyer, because your lawyer is kind of busy doing other things. Right. And if you hire a trust, remember the trustee can hire all those people. So if you're concerned because the trustee doesn't have investment experience or doesn't have legal experience. Well, the trustee is going to go hire an investment guy and hire a lawyer. Well, you're not hiring the, ex you're not getting the trustee because of their experience. You're getting because you trust them, right? And then they can take care of the other stuff. What is a professional category for bill paying when a trustee is not necessarily capable of doing so? What is it? I don't understand the question. What is a professional category for bill paying? What does that mean? Be a CPA. For example, if you have someone you trust who is the trustee and they are not able to do all the paperwork required in handling your affairs when you become unable to do yep. so, yep. whom should they enlist? The question is who would be the appropriate person? It's really going to vary depending on the, si the, the amount of the assets. You know, often, you know, CPAs will take the, will, will be able, will, will often advise you regarding those issues. Lawyers can do that. Investment guys can do it. Or, or investment guys can help manage all of that money. There are a number of those possibilities. But the main thing is, you know, if you've got a particular person in mind, you want the trustee to know that. But give the trustee the discretion to do those things. Thank you. Those are really interesting questions. Oh, I'm going to do one more and then I'm going to stop. Yes, ma'am. Just clarifying something you said earlier. My mother has a revocable trust. Revocable. Revocable so that she can take all the money back at any time or the assets. Yep. When she, when she still owns her house by herself. She doesn't own it as the trustee of the revocable trust? Eh. <laughs> right? I bet she does.
Keep going. Well, what you said is, she keeps the hospital she does. When we were children sell them, there are no capital gains. Whether she owns the house herself or if she owns the house as the trustee of the revocable trust. In either case, when she dies, the so-called tax basis of the property for capital gains purposes jumps to the date of death value. And when you sell the house, you'll pay no capital gains tax, unless you sell it for more than the date of death value. If you keep it for five years and then, and then it's worth more than when she died, you're going to pay a gain on that. Otherwise, no. Well, that was the last question. I'll be glad to take any questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll see you in a few months. Thank you.